Okay, welcome. Good morning to our uh, June uh, Metro Stormwater Management Committee meeting. I'm Dodd Galbraith, the chairman of the Metro Stormwater Committee. Glad everybody could be here. Appreciate your participation in this public process. So our first item of business this morning is to take up our meeting minutes and decision letters from May 5th. And um, as we've been advised by council, um, all committee members should use this publicly noticed time to review the minutes and decision letters to make sure they have, uh, I don't have any edits or questions or amendments to the language in the minutes or decision letters. And after you've had a chance to do that, uh, I'd like to propose we try to manage that in one motion, so if we can. So we'll take about another minute just to make sure everyone is okay. There's no more quieter time here than when we're reviewing minutes and decision letters. So. <laughs> Okay, you want to have any edits, need more time? I have an edit. All right. Um, in the second case, it indicates I recuse myself, but then it also indicates that I voted, which I did not. So if we can okay. recognize that. In the minutes. Yep. Yeah. Remove Vice Chair Stokes from the minutes. We'll, we'll take all these in one motion if we have any other edits. Any other edits or amendments? No edits or amendments on this end, but I wasn't here, so I'm going to abstain from voting. Okay, thank you. So, Chairman, I make a motion to approve the May 5th meeting minutes and with the noted correction and the associated approval letters. All right. We have a motion to uh, amend the minutes. To sp have a motion has been made properly second. Any discussion? Everyone understand the motion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? One. All right. Thank you. Okay, if our first applicants want to come up, um, this would be Ford, Prologis, Centennial Boulevard. Um, we're going to take care of some administrative <coughs> business before we have a chance to chat with you. And uh, staff's going to introduce the case, read you your legal rights uh, concerning appeal. Uh, we'll give you 10 minutes to present. At the beginning of your 10 minutes, we ask that the person that's kind of emceeing the discussion will introduce everyone at the table so we know what kind of expertise we have in front of us. After that, we'll uh, open the public hearing for anyone that would like to speak from the community, pro, uh, for or against. Uh, you'll come up to the mic. You'll be given two minutes. You'll state your name, your address, and any concerns you have within that two-minute period after you've introduced yourself. And um, if, if we don't have any other emails or phone call records or other things, we'll close the public hearing, and then the committee will start interacting in detail with uh, the applicants. So everybody understand that process? Okay. Chairman, right. I need to recuse myself from this. All right. All right. Ms. Stokes is going to need to recuse herself. It looks like we still have a quorum. So... Um, and this is consistent with last month as well, right? Okay. All right, Mr. Logan. Opening statement to the applicant. If you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Stormwater Management Committee, you may appeal the decision by filing for a writ of certiorari with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the committee's decision you are advised to seek the independent advice of legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been satisfied. Case number one on the agenda is case 
00007 Ford Prologis at 7228 Centennial Boulevard. APN is 08000200. Inspector is Lee Nelson. Council District 20, Mary Carolyn Roberts. Applicants request disturbance and encapsulations of streams and associated buffers. Appellant is 7228 Centennial Boulevard, LLC. Represented by Roy Hassel, Barge Design Solutions. Comments, stormwater staff. If a variance is granted as it relates to the site's mitigation plan, staff would recommend that the tree planting schedule include larger trees and or more densely planted trees on a greater area than the proposed 1.5 times the area of buffer disturbance. Codes had no comment provided, planning no comment provided, and greenways had no comment. Okay, so at this time, I want to ask the applicant to uh, introduce themselves and their guests, and then we'll start the 10-minute clock. All right, good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Jeff Cundiff with Barge Design Solutions, uh, civil engineer. I have uh, David Bailey here with me representing Prologis and Frank Amatucci with Barge Design Solutions, uh, representing us from an environmental perspective. Uh, Michael, if you would please uh, pull up the... Presentation, thank you. Uh, just recap, we were here last month, um, presented the case. Uh, we'll do just a very brief uh, recap of the variance request, and then we will um, you know, answer some of the questions that were outstanding from our last meeting and be available to answer any other questions y'all may have, so thank you. Uh, the site here is located behind the uh, Ford Glass plant off Briley Parkway, um, right along the Cumberland River. Uh, across from the Nashville Gun Club on Centennial Boulevard. All right, thank you. Um, the variance request here is for uh, two jurisdictional uh, stream and buffer impacts. Uh, one of them, the first one is up along the road. It is a uh, discharge from an existing detention pond that flows uh, down to the south, totaling about 0.27 acres. And the second one, uh, stream B, is um, a small uh, stream and buffer area of 0.18 acres that discharges through a culvert into a man-made ditch towards the Cumberland River. All right, thank you. Uh, just recap here, I won't go through all this again. Um, both of these stream features are uh, basically old graded channels for the most part. Uh, they're non-functional and have very little uh, resource value to them. That's stream A there along the road. And this is stream B located as you enter the site. All right, thank you. Um, so some of the unique features about this site, uh, as you can note, uh, the shape of the property, we have you know, really only one access point into the property to be able to develop it. Uh, in order for us to uh, do any project on this site, in order to get access, uh, we'll be required to impact these two stream features. Uh, the first one located up alongside the road. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, there was some question about where some of this stuff discharged previously. That, that discharges uh, from a detention pond into a culvert under a driveway and then under, into another culvert under uh, Centennial Boulevard over to the other side of the street. Uh, the stream B function there, uh, we did a dye test and found that it flows through a pretty long culvert over to uh, a man-made ditch that flows around the site and ultimately into the Cumberland River. Uh, there was some questions regarding the solid waste disposal area. So we've highlighted that in uh, green there. As you can see, these features um, don't have any impact on, on that facility there as they flow away from it. Uh, this kind of highlights the entrance here and how we have to get into the property. I wanted to show you that, you know, due to the topographic constraints and the unique narrow nature of the throat kind of coming into the property, in order for us to access the property, we're going to have to cut down that hill. And so there's really no way that we can get into the property without impacting the headwaters that would be leading to stream B or uh, stream A just being able to access straight from uh, Centennial Boulevard. All right, next slide, please. Uh, 
at the time of our last variance hearing, we didn't have all these letters uh, in the package. So I wanted just to highlight the fact that we've provided those. We have both the TDEC hydraulic determination, the core jurisdictional determination, uh, both stating that these are the only two jurisdictional features on the property. Uh, and then we also provided the TDEC solid waste closure permit back from 2005 when the solid waste area was closed out. Thank you. Um, the proposed uh, mitigation here, we've actually got a total of a two to one ratio uh, with 0.7 of that being on site and we've got an equivalent 0.2 acres of mitigation that's being required as part of our TDEC and core permits. So uh, we are, with, so that adds up to the total of 0.9 is where we got that. Uh, I think it was maybe mentioned something slightly less than that. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, let's see, and that summarizes our slide. Um, and I just want to reiterate, you know, there was a question about cut or fill over some of the solid waste disposal area. There won't be any cut in that area. And we've got fill up to roughly 24 feet over some of those spaces. So uh, this project will ultimately um, help improve the water quality for the Cumberland River because we're gonna end up essentially capping the whole site, capturing all that storm water, treating it through water quality features, and then discharging it into the Cumberland River in addition to enhancing the buffer uh, as, as presented here uh, in our variance request. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cundiff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this time, we will open up the uh, public comment period. So is there anyone here who'd like to speak in favor or against the uh, current proposal? All right, seeing none, Mr. Uh, Bowman, do we have any letters, emails, voicemail messages that we like to share or have been shared in the record? We did not have any emails, letters, voicemails, anything. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Seeing that we don't have any public input on this, so we're going to close the public hearing and open it up for the committee's uh, debate and discussion. So. All right. Um, I just I appreciate you addressing all of the concerns and questions that we had and, um, you know, doing that in a very organized and thorough way. Um, just for my understanding, um, the um, stream A, which is at the entrance of the site, right, it's discharging offsite to and across the across Centennial Boulevard. And you all are proposing to cap that, correct? Essentially encapsulate it. Um, so what is, what is the plan for that flow? Maybe I've forgot or missed something. Yeah, so that flow currently discharges onto the site from a culvert that leaves from that detention pond just upstream. And there's a section there of graded ditch that is stream A. And so we would have to turn that, we would have to put that into a culvert in order to cross and be able to bring a drive into the site. And then that culvert would, you know, it basically extend the existing culvert so that it would then tie across okay. Centennial Boulevard. But there's no treatment of the stream. It's just going to be a pass through through a culvert. Yes, it's off site water that we're just passing yeah. through our site. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'll also ask um, staff recommendations for, for larger trees in the buffer zone. Is that something you all have or will consider for the plantings? Yeah. Yes, we would, we would work with staff on that. I've got just a few kind of clarification questions. Uh, do you have any other legal ingress or egress access points that uh, you could have utilized? We do not. Have you approached any other landowners to see if you could shift that? We have, yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. That. Yeah. All right. And um, the total linear feet of the streams you're going to encapsulate, is that did I see that right, 163 feet? That was on the core letter. Is that right? That is correct. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, 
in terms of uh, core and state permits, have those been actually issued or you just, or did those letters just reference the hydrologic determinations? Uh, both the TDEC permit and the Army Corps permit have been filed. They're under uh, administrative review right now. Okay. Do you have any kind of documentation about um, uh, what their initial read is, mitigation requirements, that kind of thing? Um, right now, as far as I know, as email correspondence, they're still under review. So probably once we get, if we get an RAI, we'll have to address that. All right, so typically we like to have permits in hand uh, just to kind of see where the state and federal government is. Metro always has its own regulations and rules and policies that, that we're authorized to pursue independently of the state and federal government, but, uh, but those do typically come with this kind of variance request. So. All right, um, let's see here. I think that's all my questions. <clears throat> is the cr uh, initial crossing on Stream A, is that closed or is it open? Uh, is it closed or, I mean, currently it's a it's a ditch. No, uh, I mean the, the proposed, is it a pipe or a open bottom? Uh, we intend just to do a standard culvert with a, a closed bottom, you know. And, and for Stream B, it, it's just intermittent pretty short stretch before it goes back into a ditch. Did, was How did it score? Was it borderline or was it, I mean, what do you think caused it to be considered a stream? Uh, per TDEC rule, it had a presence of base flow and it wasn't holding any hydrologic vegetation nor to be deemed a wetland. Um, and it had a slight presence of low quality bugs like isopods that take advantage of seasonal surface water. This is an old point that I often make and I always feel compelled to make it. Um, you guys probably watch counting cars on the TV show occasionally. Um, or counts cars, I think it's called, if you, you know, where the, the car show where they go out and they find these rusty hulks out in somebody's backyard, junkyard, and they make them look amazing. You hated yourself there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think my gray hair. I, I think okay. I think, I think my gray hair dates dates me too. But um, it, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a show about how you can take you know basically a car body and turn it into this amazing car. So my my point is, and I realize you guys are engineers for the most part, uh, uh, business people representing the company. Um, I've seen 25 linear feet of stream that looked worse than this site, restored, attract salamander larva, red-tailed hawks, you know, all kinds of native plants. Uh, it's possible to bring a degraded stream like this back to a, to a better condition. So that, that, that's our obligation is to protect these kind of resources, to try to not piecemeal them to death. We pretty rarely um, approve encapsulation of streams. I think the, the, um, our tendency in the past has been to approve public projects because they tend to be less rare, more critical to the general welfare than the public good. Uh, private developments occur every day in this county. If we mitigated every one of them before long, we wouldn't have any streams left. So that, that's kind of the balance that we're trying to strike here is what is the value of this stream's potential under a better site design, a different site design, a different economic type development plan versus what we have right now. Uh, because we're not really compelled uh, to make this work just because y'all can't make it work. Somebody else might can make it work in a way that preserves the public interest in regard to these streams. So. I just have to, I routinely make that point, so, okay. Given that, is there any potential or consideration of putting some sort of like bridge over the stream and maintaining some of the nat natural features and restore it, or is that just impossible? I mean, even 
even if we were to put like you know a bridge structure i mean we're still going to be cutting off you know the light and everything else down there to it and, and the buffer i mean it, it with the lack of kind of bed and bank definition and it kind of being more of a man-made feature i, I mean it, it it's i just don't i guess i'm struggling to see in some of the benefit of that um but if you know maybe an open bottom box or something could be considered you know over that you know that first entrance there um, I think that would be something we could look at. Can I ask a question? Let me let me make sure I understand the stream concept correctly here, because I, I I didn't see in your site plan the extents, unless this entire site is the extents of the previously capped landfill. Is that this entire site? No. Do you mind going back to that previous slide, Michael? And is this stream within that? Limit, uh, you know, when, when they capped the landfill, um, you know, it's the, the, this this stream just pop up as having some flow in it based on how the site was graded when they capped the landfill. Uh, no, is you or is this part of the natural topography of the existing site? So the the stream A would be due to just past construction work that's occurred there. Stream B is due to some of the natural topography where and then it ties into a man-made head wall just right there at the edge and goes into a culvert the area in green there is the solid waste disposal area and both of these features flow away from that area okay so does that answer your question yes But Logan, I'm I'm still confused because you're allowed to disturb a stream buffer to cross it, and so as long as they do an open bottom crossing on stream A, I don't I'm still confused why that even triggers a variance. Yeah, it might have to do with the angle. I don't know if you've measured the angle, but typically we allow perpendicular up to 15 degrees. Yeah, I mean it kind of meanders through there a little bit, so. Uh... Uh, it's pretty close, so I think we just wanted to go ahead and include it in the request just to make sure that we were all covered here. So, um, and then stream B, obviously, they're the source of it is somewhat unknown, and and um, but it goes back into an open graded ditch, and so it but it's in a big cut area where essentially it's going to be cut out, so that's the one that is the bigger focus. Yeah, so let's let's resolve one of these streams. So let's. I mean, I think we're in agreement on. There's two issues. Let's resolve the first one, stream A. Are we in agreement that stream A is okay as proposed to install the culvert? I, I want to just maybe let's try to come to a resolution and a methodological <laughs> method here. We keep kind of going in circles. So, can we handle this in a step-by-step -step approach, Mr. Chair? That's the best way to do it. Okay. All right. All right, so do we have an agreement on Stream A? Are we done talking about Stream A? Are there any more questions on Stream A? It, it, I think it is the applicant proposing to make the culvert a uh, three-sided culvert. Yes, we will do that. Okay. Okay. And how many feet is this culvert? Uh, it, we will minimize it just to the road crossing, what's required for grading. I mean, the total impact right now is, you know, 88 feet, but, you know. So it's about it, half of the total proposed. Yes, okay. and if we can if we can minimize that, we will. Okay, all right. So we have a uh, three-sided culvert on Stream A crossing. All right. And, and the applicant has answered our request to determine where it flows to from our last meeting. So we have that information now, and that's acceptable. Okay. So how do we feel about the issue of not having core and state permits? Could we potentially accept the, you know, open bottom culvert for stream A pending permits from the state? Well, and I don't even know if that needs to be a condition because they're going to have to have the permits to yeah. do it. So yeah. before prior to grading permit approval. It'll be a requirement, yeah. so. Yeah. That's why I used the word feel. <laughs> okay. All right. So you're ready to proceed to B? All right. Everybody ready to proceed to B? All right. All right.
yeah. I mean, to to Mr. Fulmer's point, um, I, this is the the beginning of the stream is part of the development plan, which is going to be modified in a manner that. Um, doesn't seem to, well, help me out here, Mr. Fulmer. I, you, you, you said something about how the, the inlet of the stream is going to be modified in a manner that. I, I, just looking at this screen, it's hard to believe that the man-made actions are pretty much would have triggered the indicators that create this to be a stream rather than it being a natural resource. Mm -hmm. If they redesign the whole site to work around this little stretch, the activity is going to prevent hawks and you know, anything from really utilizing this resource. I think that there's a lot more value to, to, to other resources in the, you know, in the water quality measures that are going to be put in place and the buffer enhancements. If, if TDEC and the Corps are fine with this, then I... You know, I, I don't want to give away and, you know, to your point, just wipe away every applicant that comes in. But at, at the same time, I, I think this is somewhat of a man-made condition. That's, that's where I was trying to head with what part of this site was uh, existing conditions or capped landfill. But I think most of this is man-made, to your point. The, there's, I, I've got a little bit of history with this site, and I think that it, while the landfill is isolated in a different portion, this site has been a somewhat of an environmental nightmare. <laughs> and so it, I think that there's been activity all over it. And rather than thinking it's been untouched for a long time, because I know the glass plant used to just dump a bunch of material over there. And then it ultimately got split off from the glass plant site. And it's, it's going to do a lot of good to clean up all those issues. I would be scared to read the phase two on it. And, and in this case, um, it, 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 is this an area where landfill runoff would be entering this particular portion of the stream? Is that what you're getting at as well? Treated landfill runoff? It, it, it could be. The, the water that reaches that stream does go across the other portions of the site that are likely contaminated um, so it, the livelihood of that stream is probably not great now uh, what type of uh, culvert were you all planning on using here it actually wouldn't be a culvert because of the fill there um, it was just going to be on. under a building i mean we're going to have you know uh, a road going through there so we'll have roadside ditches so all the surface water is going to be collected with a new conveyance system and treated so this is pretty high in the drainage area as well. Is, it, that, is it, it almost it, it a, is. so that, that gets back to the question earlier about is this ephemeral or is this really a stream? Right. Okay, okay. But either way, it's pretty high in the water. Can you answer that? So just above it is like kind of like a man-made catch basin that they excavated out to okay. the bedrock, and, and it that's... holds that water still there, and then it's long enough to keep a base flow going. Okay, yeah. that, help, that helps a lot. Thank so you. By rule, intermittent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Does that cover point number two? All right. Now, the third item is staff's recommendation so what do y'all think about that yeah that generally relates to survivability on larger trees is greater than saplings so um, in the interest in everyone's interest it might be better to come back with larger trees okay so it sounds like we've got uh, one condition on stream a and then staff's recommendation would those be acceptable to you all? Yes. Okay. Right. Sounds like we have the makings of a motion. <laughs> I, I make a motion to approve with the condition of a three sided culvert for crossings of stream A. Um, and, and they can deviate from the 15 degree maximum for the crossing. Uh, and to satisfy staff's uh, comments of larger trees. 
Everybody understand the motion? Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? I'll second. All right, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. All right, thank you. Thank you for your preparation, gentlemen. Thanks for letting us educate the public in the process and future applicants as well. Okay. We are ready for our next case after a very judicious discussion. Edwin Warner Park, 7311 Highway 100. Were you all present for the reading of the legal statement concerning your rights of appeal? Okay. All right, so Mr. Bowman is going to introduce your case. I, and did you hear me describe the process earlier that we go through? Okay. All right. Case number two on the agenda is case 2022-00008, Edwin Warner Park at 7311 Highway 100. APN is 157-00001000. Inspector is Kenneth Tranter, Council District 34, Angie Henderson. Applicants request disturbance and encapsulation of streams and associated buffers. Appellant is Metro Nashville and Davidson County Parks Department. Mark Bradfield, Metro Parks is the representative. Comments, stormwater staff. MWS via our ongoing Metro Department coordination and looking for sites with stormwater quality retrofit potential is contributing watershed improvement fund monies to this project. Portion, read the demo of pavilions and asphalt and floodway. Staff deems it a beneficial project that can hopefully serve as a template for other such projects at other Metro Parks properties. Code said no comment provided. Planning, no comment provided. Greenways, Greenways Division supports the proposed project due to its improvement to the associated floodway and its benefit to public recreation areas once complete. The area in question is currently deteriorating and needs attention. These improvements are much needed and will enhance the park overall. Okay, so at this time, I'll ask your, the person who's kind of MC in your discussion, introduce yourself, introduce your extra guest per, expert guest, and then uh, we'll start the 10 minute clock. After the 10 minutes, we'll proceed with public hearing and committee debate. Sure, my name is Michael Pavin. Uh, I'm a project manager, landscape architect with Collier Engineering. I have Mark Bradfield with me from Metro Parks Department. We're representing several stakeholders that are part of this project, uh, mainly the Friends of Warner Park, uh, who's providing the, the bulk of the funding to make this possible. Uh, Metro Water Services has been involved as the staff comments went through. The Cumberland River Compact is involved with the reforestation effort, and I believe uh, the Harpeth River um, Conservancy, I believe, is also going to be involved in the project in some way as of late. So the project um, basically has two goals. One is ecologically focused to um, enhance and protect the stream banks along the Little Harpeth River. Uh, if you guys are familiar with Edwin Warner Park, this is um, the entrance that is off of Vaughn Road. It's the southernmost part of the park um, that all is located along the Little Harpeth, and it's the farthest corner towards Endworth, Endsworth High School. Uh, there's two existing pavilions back there. Uh, we call them pavilions number 10 and pavilion 11. Uh, the, focus here is to remove those two um, and I'll talk about pavilion 10 first is the one uh, to the right of the screen as you see up there that uh, both of those pavilions are located almost right on the top of the bank right now uh, they're very well loved by the public, which has caused erosion and um, other issues. There's been previous efforts to stabilize the banks in these areas. Um, and then I believe it was March flood event last year, there was some damage to the infrastructure down here, which kind of became the impetus of this project. So Pavilion 10 and 11 will be completely removed. Um, the parking areas associated with those will also be removed. Uh, I think it ends up our net reduction of about a half an acre of impervious surface in the floodplain. Um, Pavilion 10 will be replaced, and that is proposed, as you see in the top right there, um, 
that pavilion would be replaced with a newer, nicer shelter that will hopefully serve many future generations. Also replacing the parking in that area. Um, what's not maybe super clear on our plan here that we've moved it back to the farthest extents of an open field that exists. Uh, just beyond that is a forested area. Uh, there's some wet weather conveyances that run through there as well. So we pick that area as the least disturbance possible with keeping a, a shelter in the same general area that the public uh, very much enjoys right now. So it is located outside of the floodway, but it is still located within the buffer. Um, that pavilion right now, we have the finished floor of the slab posed to be slightly above the two year, which does, uh, Logan, I didn't see the request for the uncompensated fill, but there is a little bit of uncompensated fill on our application as one of our requests. And because that pavilion would sit about two feet above the existing grade, uh, the parking lot is at grade. There's no fill associated with that. Um, so it's a minor amount of uncompensated with, with that uh, structure there. Uh, the existing Pavilion 11 goes completely away. We're taking out all of the associated paving and parking. Uh, the highlighted areas are associated with that. And then the dark hatched area in both of those uh, are reforestation areas. So there is an element of kind of buffer uh, reestablishment, uh, try to get people off of the bank and protect the water quality issues there. Uh, off the page, just for informational purposes, there is uh, another pavilion we're replacing, which is Pavilion 9. It's getting replaced with a new bigger pavilion to help offset the, uh, the removal of Pavilion 11, but that is outside of the floodplain. Um, doesn't really have any impact on this. Uh, and then there's one small parking area that is also outside the buffer, not associated, but that would be the improvements shown at the top there, uh, which is again, cleaning up some, some parking areas that right now are gravel and eroded and um, we would be paving those as well to kind of stabilize them. Um, I think that about covers it, so. All right, thank you, Michael, appreciate it. Um, so at this time, I want to open up the uh, public hearing portion of our discussion. Is there uh, anyone here who'd like to speak in favor or against the uh, current variance proposal? If you want to do that, you can come up to the lectern and uh, introduce yourself, your address. We'll give you a couple of minutes. All right. Do we have any letters, uh, voicemails? Uh, banners hung anywhere in the community? <laughs> no, no emails, letters, anything like that. <laughs> okay. All right. Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Um, Mr. Bowman, for the purpose of our uh, informed debate, needs to reread into the record the conditions for the various proposal because there's some typos in the current packet that you all received. So it looks like there's there's four conditions. I think I may have read it wrong. Um, it's number one is disturbance within the floodway buffer. Request a variance to buffer requirements for the relocation of Edwin Warner Park Pavilion number 10 and associated parking. Number two, continuous mowing and maintenance for portions of the floodway and buffer to provide open recreation area. Three is variance to buffer signage regulations to provide educational and informational signs at key locations in lieu of standard buffer sign and spacing. And four is up to 500 cubic yards of uncompensated fill in the floodplain. All right, we're uh, open for committee discussion and review. Had a question about the continuous mowing. Is that already currently maintained and mowed, or is this additional area and then you're reforesting? It is existing maintained area. Oh. So when we're finished, the reforestation would replace currently maintained areas. So there will be less when we're done, but it's a legacy. Okay, thanks. I think it is fair to say too that, uh, let me just ask a question. Uh, do you all have a regular tree planting program in the park near these sites where you're constantly introducing new native trees? 
that are not required by mitigation or any other requirements? That's hard to answer. Um, I'd say that yes would be the answer that's fairly accurate for all parks. I wouldn't say that there's any concentration in this area, but there, going forward there would be. That's what the, the Friends Group's intent was, to have partnerships with the Common River Compact and various other uh, agencies to, to improve the buffer in the areas that have been d damaged over the years by the communities. Uh, use of those areas. Okay. Yeah, that's been my observation just as a private citizen out there. So. Silence usually means we're ready for a motion. The chairman normally doesn't make motions. Um, chairman, I make a motion to approve this variance request based on the overall um, improvements to the area, the reduction of impervious services, um, and the intent that was put into the design. Thank you. I'll second. All right, we have a motion has been made and properly seconded. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you for your preparation and your work. Thank, Thank you. Come to River Compact. All right, so at this time, we're going to take up uh, non variance business, which is always more fun. And we're going to ask Council Representative Swope to come up. Uh, he's been graciously waiting in the back as a busy public servant with a with another life in addition to his public service. And he's going to <laughs> he's going to make some comments and ask some questions that uh, we've had some uh, legal input on. And this is. I, I guess I should say that this discussion needs to be taken in the context of broad policy understanding and not related to any future variances or specific variance decisions that we might undertake. So. Uh, Chairman Gavin, thank you. Uh, members of the commission, first off, thank you for your service. We're all public servants, and, and I'm going to try to be as brief as humanly possible, but let's let's talk through one specific instance that actually does affect general policy as, as we all move forward. As you know, FEMA has redefined all of our flood lines, floodplain lines, um, which has created specific instances around this county that are going to present an immense consideration on y'all's part specifically. Um, case in point, 5420 uh, Stone Run Lane, Stone Box Lane, excuse me. Um, little dead end subdivision, 12 homes, one lot left, PUD goes back 20 years. Uh, there is a very small, I'm not even going to call it a stream, it's a creek uh, that exists along the northern side or the northwestern side of this particular road. Um, it is a very hilly area. Um, most of these homes are built with, you know, a 20-foot offset from the road and 20 feet on the back side of the house. And then there's a 45-degree cliff that goes down about 30 feet to this little creek. Um, because of the new floodplain lines, now the new setback for this particular lot is 75 feet versus 30 on the original PUD, which makes the lot unbuildable. Um, all this transpired over the course of the last year. Um, this property was bought. They contracted a home to be built on it. Um, the couple that owns this currently lives in Guadalajara because they have nowhere to live in Nashville. Um, they would have been here today, but I said, guys, guys, it's a little early for that. Um, but planning staff and stormwater have both said you need a 75 foot setback. Um, in this particular instance, a 75 foot back makes this lot completely unbuildable, uh, which means you got to put front setbacks and everything else on a 25 foot strip of land next to the road. It's impossible. Um, as constituents of mine, they reached out and said, how do we deal with this? I reached out to staff. I reached out to Mr. Bowman, a few others. And nobody really knows, nobody has an answer for this. So that brings me to your table this morning to ask, how do we deal with this moving forward? Because I guarantee you, I'm not the only council member who's gonna have a problem with this. Um, if this were all flat land, I could absolutely say, wouldn't be here. But there 
are specific instances. We, we, we live in a, in, a, in a city with great topography, a lot of mountains, a lot of hills um, that make for great building sites, actually. But <laughs> with FEMA's redesign on their 500 and 100 year flood lines, uh, it, it makes all these places impossible to build on. So I, I don't even know what the question here is other than how do we move forward? What would I recommend to my constituents to do? Um, and, and, and I welcome any of y'all's thoughts on this. I, th I think it'd be fair if I uh, shared with the committee uh, what uh, legal advice we've gotten, and then I'll, I'll add some additional comments to kind of further clarify you know, our, what you already know about our role as a stormwater various committee, but um, we sent an email, uh, the Metro stormwater staff sent an email to council representative Swope that said basically, um, in terms of administering new FEMA maps with the sanction of Metro legal in terms of public policy, when updated maps become, um, when updated maps, become public even before the implementation date, it has been our historic practice to hold any applications in these updated map areas to the new standards as a matter of protecting both public health and the property owner involved. Now, that, that being said, that specifically is focusing on properties that are flooding more frequently that the federal government has mapped as such. So it's it's the flooding that we're trying to protect people from. It's been a good idea. Now that being said, every site has specific characteristics. There are um, a variety of of uh, guidelines that we can consider in variances. Um, uh, the state appeals court has sort of narrowed our understanding of hardship. Uh, so economic hardships and developability is, is no longer uh, in doubt in terms of whether or not we can grant a variance. It has to be a hydro, it has to be a, a landscape specific anomaly that the buffer ordinance and the floodplain ordinances could not have foreseen. So that's a pretty rare circumstance. That being said, Every applicant is encouraged to um, make a proposal for a variance and we'll give it a, a just hearing. So does anybody want to add anything to that for the council representatives understanding or feedback? Uh, okay, yeah, please. Um, so I'm not sure I'm wearing the hat of this committee if this is okay to say or not, but ultimately the FEMA uh, maps being redrawn is intended to uphold public health, safety, and welfare. And um, we, you know, much of the work that I do is on flooding and resilience and those things, and they're limited options. But ultimately, I would say, you know, your constituents that are concerned and have this property, the real question is, do they want to flood? And how much of that do they want to deal with? And, you know, regardless of variance or not, you know, those maps have been drawn based on better information than we had before, and they're still, you know, we're seeing more intense storm events in the area. So those maps could, you know, in five or 10 years be obsolete and, you know, more encouragement into areas, um, expanded floodways and floodplains. So um, looking at, you know, future projections for climate, those things are considerations. So it's, you know, while you bring forth one particular case and I feel for them, you know, but the reality is that we're here thinking about the general public and the welfare of them. And in all honesty, we're going to see more flooding in this area because of the terrain. And, you know, we can't wave that off easily. So, yeah, yeah, Dr. I, Camp, if I may. Yeah. I have literally used this particular commission to stop more development in my district than you will ever know about. Um, I, I absolutely respect what you're saying and agree with it entirely. Uh, I think there is like, hmm, w without being in 
incredibly public about this. We, we, we borderline risk being overdeveloped as a city right now, as it currently stands. Um, and again, as I said early on, th there will be very specific instances now that these lines have changed. And I literally was on this property an hour and a half ago. I, this creek would have to rise 60 feet to affect any of the homes that are currently existing on the street. So it's where a moniker of common sense needs to come into the, the conversation. Um, and again, everything on Holt Road, <laughs> I use your specific commission to stop development on Holt Road. And I've done it over and over again for seven years and will continue to do so as long as I'm able to do so, because I agree with you. Um, we are at the brink of being overdeveloped, and my district is one that is still rural for all intents and purposes, and everybody in my district wants to keep it that way. But again, you have specific instances that are going to pop up, and, and it won't be in downtown. It won't be in the DTC. It, it'll be in Madison and Gallatin and Bellevue and Brentwood and Antioch and a few other places where things are somewhat still rural, and you've got existing PUDs, you've got lots that have, haven't been developed yet that now you can't develop on. And, and, if, and if these particular... Uh, landowners hadn't have already bought the property, paid cash for it, paid for the house to be designed, the whole nine yards, I wouldn't be here. But it, it, it brought to light in my head that this is going to be an issue moving forward, not just on my, my behalf, but on all of our, all my fellow compatriots in the council. We're, we're going to have this problem. So all I ask is, is that, that, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you all, should I, advise my constituents to basically put in a, a pretty comprehensive variance request? One thing before they do anything, they need to find out their insurability of the property and with the, if they're going to have a mortgage on it, the bank may not loan money on anything in a floodplain. That, that's already been handled and right. I mean they're paying cash. So it's not a bank issue, It's and they've already checked the insurance requirements and everything else, um, they have no problems with that. Here we are. Okay. I, I know. I, <laughs> Pistol, it, was like, it was the first question I asked them as well. Yeah, uh, it's, you know. it, it's, it's, it's always a, I'm sorry. Oh, no, it, it sounds to me that the flooding is not the issue, it's buffer encroachment. Correct. And, and it's an extra, a bigger buffer because of the floodway. It exactly. Adds 50 feet. So I, I think that there's considerations in times like these to request a reduced buffer. Yep depending on where their driveway is, where, you know, the design of the house or their, you know, so I, I mean, this isn't too dissimilar from a case we heard a couple months ago. So I, I would think that a application would be, you know, fair in this case. Okay. But each one will be different case by case. Oh, well, absolutely and, it will be. And, and you and can design houses to flood. I mean, there's one, <laughs> there's, I mean, they do it. There's one. Yeah. Yeah, there's floodway yep. crawl spaces. People have garages underneath the floodplain, and I would never do it, but okay, well, it can be done. Again, this particular lot, we would have to have, you know, a second NOAA event for this to ever flood. Yeah, and I think, you know, all that begs the point, you know, a lot of people come in here with an understanding that they're only dealing with a buffer issue, and then they find out from an engineer they're also dealing with an unforeseen flood issue. You know, um, the storm events it, it, that we're seeing today used to have a 1% probability of occurring. You know, those statistics are gone when the chemistry of the atmosphere changes. As, as hot summers suck up more water vapor, and it's exactly. going to come down somewhere sometime. I mean, it has to. Yeah. It's just uh, mass balance equations, yeah. It's, it's just like money. It goes from one account to the other. It's, it's, it's got to come down or, or go out. So, so, the, uh, uh, so the bottom line is they need to understand their technical data-driven liability. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, we'll deal with it as best we can within the context of all the other cases we hear. So. Well, I, I apologize that it that it, it it feels burdensome no. to some uh, individuals, but that's that's well. That's this the way is we this work. this is part and parcel of the process that we're all going to face yes. moving forward. Yes. It's designed um, to keep us. And safe. and I sincerely respect all of your time. 
to Thank listen you. to me. I know this is kind of an oddball situation where nothing's quite happened yet, but here I am. So, Well, the, the best thing about it is we've had an open, transparent, honest conversation. And I have to tell you something. You guys are the funnest council I've ever been with. <laughs> <laughs> you we, guys laugh. We, Try to get this kind of a reaction at planning. I dare you. <laughs> we do work at that. I'm, I'm too old to be bored. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, sir. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your time very much. All right. So I want to apologize to the next publicly noticed item of business, but uh, our guidelines do give a little bit of priority to the raw written guidelines do give a little bit of priority to council representatives. So if y'all want to come forward, I understand you have a presentation about uh, mitigation, flood mitigation systems on Dry Creek. And this is not a variance, even though it looks like one from the, their assemblage. <laughs> so don't anybody get uptight. Uh, we're going to relax and enjoy a geeky discussion that I love about uh, mitigation and flooding. So <laughs> Good. Turn, turn on your mic, please, and just introduce yourself and everyone else, if you don't mind. Appreciate y'all seeing us today. Um, I'm Clayton Foster with Barge Design Solutions. I'm a civil engineer and the project manager of this. This is Aaron Thomas. He's the site engineer for Dry Creek Water Reclamation Facility. And this is Adrian Ward, who's a civil engineer with Barge Design Solutions as well. Um, should be coming up here in just a second, but we prepared a presentation at the, so we had our pre-application meeting with uh, the Stormwater Management Committee, and they recommended that we try to get before y'all uh, early to introduce the project, uh, to get any feedback y'all might be able to provide because it has a lot of interesting components as it has evolved and just making sure that we provide what we need when we do come before for our variance. So um, Dry Creek uh, Water Reclamation Facility is a 24 MGD average plant with a 63 MGD peak. Uh, it feeds in from a bunch of different communities even outside of Davidson County, Hendersonville, uh, Ridgetop, and Gallatin, and a few others, I believe, and uh, we'll get to those in a little bit. So here's our brief agenda. Uh, why are we here? What is the project? What do we need? And then just talk about the schedule of getting back before you guys. Uh, so um, the Dry Creek Water Reclamation Facility in Rivergate has a history of flooding. Um, one back in 1975, and you can see the high water mark there, uh, had a flooding elevation of 428.8, and then the May 2010 flood, which we'll speak a little bit more in detail as a part of this, <clears throat> this project, because that's what directly led to our mitigation, had an elevation of 434.15. Uh, so <clears throat> probably a, just a good encompassing picture of what the May 2010 flood was, caused significant damage to the metro um, plant, uh, received 14 inches of rain over two consecutive days, resulting in a maximum flood elevation of the plant of 434. Uh, um, a substantial portion of the plant lies below the May 2010 flood elevation, and therefore the site was almost completely inundated by floodwaters, including the majority of the plant's electrical distribution center system, the entire tunnel system, the process buildings throughout the plant area. Uh, so this is just an overview that somebody took of the site, and you can see this is an aerial photo that shows the elevations, the, f the f uh, uh, finished floor elevations of the building relative to flood. So you know, south of the page, you can see that the influent pump station almost had 11 feet, the equipment building 6.3 um, submerged, 6.8 for the chlorine, and you can see that as it goes around. Um, just some before and afters that we tried to match here just to kind of show some of the devastation and we can go through these uh, quite quickly but just side electrical um, submerged with multiple feet um, this next one that shows the influent pump station um, you can really see how submerged uh, it became um, so quickly from this the aftermath of the flood the plant was down for 30 days there was four million dollars worth of equipment damage with the plant being down for 30 days, there was approximately 1.25 billion gallons of wastewater that was overflowed directly untreated into the into Dry Creek or and then ultimately into the Cumberland River. So quite an effect on the community. So I guess to answer the question that you know of the agenda is why are we here? We're designing a flood mitigation system to protect this critical facility from future flood events, which will ensure the health and safety of the community. Um, 
might be asking yourself, that was 2010, how did we get here so we can go through these? But we submitted a hazard mitigation proposal to FEMA. It took several iterations for them to finally approve this. Um, if you want to keep clicking through. Um, <laughs> sorry. I thought I would control this. Sorry, my first time coming through, I thought I'd control it. So uh, my apologies, but thank you for your help. Um, so we, they submitted an RFI in 2019 that we responded to quickly after. And ultimately, it was approved with a benefit cost analysis of 2.63. If you're not familiar with that process, anything over a one is deemed uh, approved, would be approvable by FEMA and therefore reimbursable. So that's where the project started. Uh, Barge, we came under contract with Metro in uh, March of 2021 designing this project. So it's been a long time coming. We're excited to be before y'all to, to get this moving through. Um, so next slide is uh, so what is the project? What, is, what, what are the protection elevations? Um, so we're designing to a 500 year river vein event plus two feet and that's to meet uh, metro ordinances and codes that because this is a critical action facility you need to protect it to a higher elevation uh, than just the 500 year. The OEM multi-hazard mitigation progress report states that all electrical equipment shall be installed at the 500 year plus two or flood of record whichever is greater. So obviously we're doing it to that 500 year flood event which is, gets us to the 439. Um, so just kind of talking about the Dry Creek, if you're not familiar with where the site is, it's loaded, located at the confluence of Dry Creek, Grizzard Creek, which isn't shown, but that's kind of on the eastern boundary, and the Cumberland River. Um, if wastewater treatment plants are commonly found along, uh, the, are, are at the lowest lying area, just so that it can flow by gravity down. So we're site constrained on where this would be, where a facility like this could be located. Um, it's not, fee it would not be feasible to locate this to out of the floodplain and, and rebuild this somewhere else. That you would, you would generally find this here. Um, Another point about this is we can't just raise all the buildings here. There's tunneling and electrical equipment and everything that needs to be in the tunnels underneath. And so that's at a set elevation. So it's not quite as simple as just, well, why don't we raise up everything to meet some of those requirements that we need a full, a full system around this to protect everything that cannot be moved from its location. Um, as I mentioned before, this this plant serves many communities, the Ridgetop White House, Millersville, Hendersonville, and Old Hickory send their wastewater to the site. So when the plant is down, it affects every one of these communities. It's not just localized to one community or metro or anything like that. This is a, a, a middle, a, a you know, North Nashville area issue that we are trying to help resolve um, from some of these future events. Um, so if we were to move it, we would just, if we were to try to move this entire facility, it would just be moving it, moving the problem to a different area. Um, so talking about, this was our original design. As you can see, we tried to uh, mimic and stay as close to the existing infrastructure as we could. So with the wall alignment following as close and around and being built on top of certain structures just to minimize our impacts. So we'd originally designed this as a sheet pile system to minimize what we would need to do and our effects on this wall. In our more detailed discussions with the uh, sheet pile manufacturer, you can't install a uh, sheet pile flood wall uh, a cantilevered system up past eight feet out of the ground. Uh, and so there's an issue with uh, You'd have to do a battered pile system, which with some of the existing infrastructure that is there, we couldn't do those on an angle uh, to, to make that system work and limit our proposal. So that's, that's our issue on the south side is that all of our wall on the south side of the plant shown in red is 13 feet or taller out of the ground. Um, at a minimum, if you get down in the lower right-hand corner or southeast, you're getting up to 20 feet tall, roughly. Uh, on the north side of the site, sheet piles, another, not another option there because um, following the geotech report, we found that rock was shallow by was, was very shallow and wouldn't allow us to meet the requirements of the Army Corps of Engineers, um, which requires us to be two and a half times the depth of your sheet pile above wall. So we had to look at a different system, which if you go to the next slide, we started looking at a concrete flood wall, which would meet the unique requirements that this site would require. Um, but some of the issues that we ran into trying to not have any impacts on the stream where with these flood wall types, we were either going to have to, around the influent pump station up on the top left, we would need to uh, install the, <clears throat> we'd either need to install it on the structure, which the existing influent pump station was not designed for 
uh, that kind of, so there'd be major modifications and early design was showing that it was potentially not feasible. If we were to move it external, we were looking at a 30 foot tall wall. And so just the footer on that would extend out into the existing. Uh, if you go around to the middle of the page where it shows a two to one, um, it's severely eroded in that area, as you can kind of see from those at the two to one slope. And so we were worried that as we installed this system that ultimately it would get undermined and we would need to look at something else. Um, on the right side of the page, near the final settling tanks, you can see it's at a one-to-one, -one, so even stronger of a slope, and we were worried about undermining there as well. Uh, so that led us to what our ultimate design is. Uh, for this one, if you go to the next slide, well, so we looked at two different options. Um, this is the first one. If we were just to rip wrap it to armor it to protect it, um, you can see that even on an aggressive two-to-one slope, we would not be able to... Uh, that we would fill up the stream with the riprap going up the steep slopes that we would need to. And these two cross sections that we pulled for the Corps of Engineers aren't even at the worst parts as you can kind of see on the left side. So that led us to our ultimate design that we're here with, which is a stream relocation along with the flood wall so that we can protect the flood, the, the flood mitigate the flood wall that we are installing to protect this critical facility. But we're also putting back a heavily eroded stream that's degraded. Um, that has been degraded to the point that uh, we're going to put back a natural stream design and raise that S SQT score. Um, we tried to minimize exactly how much of the stream buffer we were going to encroach on, by, especially on the south side. Uh, you can see that we, uh, we're cutting off, we're, we're cutting across the site to minimize the utilities that are underneath and the uh, have enough room for our footer that's required for this wall that's 13 feet tall. I guess one other point I'd like to make about the, if we were to have gone, if, if even if this project doesn't go through, Metro would be back before you requesting some sort of stream stabilization um, for those slopes because it is encroached so closely to some of their existing infrastructure that they need to start in protecting this critical facility from just getting washed out um, underneath. Uh, so um, just with this, we're doing a natural stream design of both of these creeks. The, the Grizzard Creek over to the right side is going to be, uh, it's, it goes off the page of here, but this just was our best overall for the um, facility. You can see the Dry Creek, we're adding in the more serpentine type flow, which, we're, which is going to minimize erosion and ultimately pr produce less sediment than the current uh, stream is providing down to the Cumberland River. Um, I guess next slide. So why are we here before you? Um, we have 30,000 cubic yards of uncompensated fill in the floodplain. So that includes, so with the, with the flood wall installation, we're in, we are uh, removing 40,000 cubic yards of flood storage with the design that we have for our stream. We're adding back in 10,000, so a net of 30,000 is what we're requesting. Um, we are currently completing a no-rise in Clomer to confirm there are no impacts downstream with this. However, we don't anticipate those due to uh, the backwaters from the Cumberland River, um, but we are still getting that confirmed up. Uh, in terms of disturb, if you go back, I guess, the slide. Uh, disturbance of the stream buffer of Dry Creek and Grizzard Creek, um, as we kind of mentioned there with the flood wall uh, being in the location just to make sure that it's it's installed and can will not have to worry about being undermined, uh, that's going to be a stream. We've got the stream relocation that's going to affect that and then because we're relocating the stream, um, some of the existing infrastructure is going that's 60 years old is going to have to get replaced because of where we're relocating the stream, some of the manholes and making that work. Uh, so we're going to have a disturbance in the stream buffer and we hope are the um, so we're taking a highly eroded stream with high steep stream banks and natural low flow channels and floodplain and adding back vegetation replacement of aging infrastructure would help stream quality and we're uh, helping with uh, sediment downstream by giving this a more natural stream design, uh, which will help with all of those. Um, just as an overall, had our system been installed back in May 2010, uh, we would have potentially saved a billion gallon. There would have been a point where we still, the, the plant would have been non-operational because it flows by gravity down that you have to wait till the waters recede, but you could have potentially saved a billion gallons from overflowing by this uh, being installed, which is obviously to the benefit of the entire community. Um, so 
I guess that just in terms of schedule, these are all of our permits that we're currently in the process of trying to acquire. Um, so my question, one of my questions for the committee is, are we able to get back to you sooner um, to get this approved, which would be my, my hope, and then we'll obviously be getting the, these permits um, through it. So is that it? That's it. All right. Sorry to go through so quick. Okay, I got a procedural question for staff. Um, why are, did we not hear this as a preliminary review kind of proposal as opposed to the way we're hearing about it today? We, you know, we had multiple discussions about that. I think um, at the time they were ready to submit. They didn't necessarily have their hydrologic determination, so we didn't exactly know what was on site, and they weren't quite prepared with landscape mitigation plans and things like that, which we typically see on a preliminary. So it's more just an informational um, I mean, I don't know if you can provide comment or anything like that, but. So would, would any applicant have this opportunity or is this primarily a opportunity that a public agency might be granted just because of the lower frequency of this type of project coming before us? It seems like we've done this before with bigger projects like a River North. I remember there being some presentations on overall project and things like that, so. It does seem consistent with what we've allowed before. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, it's it's a publicly noticed event. That's that's the good thing about it. Yeah, it I, I, and this is not a concern that I want to sound like I'm being negative towards staff about or negative towards you all about. It, 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 I just want to make sure that other applicants understand the process because this is a televised hearing. People, you'd be surprised who listens to these things and what they learn from it. So, um, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's unusual that we would get this kind of proposal in a business portion of our discussion. It would usually come in as some kind of preliminary or some kind of variance proposal. So I just want to make sure everybody understands that. Um, uh, I guess, secondly, I, I'm not real sure whether or not we should comment on this at all. Um, I, I see legal counsel possibly agreeing with that. No, I think it was just purely for informational purposes. Okay, okay. so I, the only reason I say that is that, you know, this kind of stuff is interesting and exciting to folks like members of the committee. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. But uh, <laughs> but um, we just need to be careful and cautious because uh, we function as a quasi-judicial body. This would be a little bit akin to convening a jury and judge and having a conversation about a case before the case is heard. So that, I realize you asked us for feedback, but we're probably not going to be able to give it to you today. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, if any other business in town doing uh, work for Metro wants to have a free ad on public TV, <laughs> come on down and get it publicly noticed. But uh, that's a bad joke. I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> just trying to create a little bit of levity. But, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really important that we understand these issues. It's also important we follow the due process. Okay. All right. Okay, any other comments or conversations? I would say that was interesting to watch. So thank you for sharing. The public needs to understand these things. All right, anybody else? Okay, let's see. Do we have any other items of business that the staff wants to present? Seeing none, this is usually where we entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. All right, we have a motion to Thank adjourn. You. Is there a second? Second's been made. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed? Abstains. All right, we're adjourned. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.